Kia ora and welcome everyone. We have Corbin Turner joining us today to present a session on real world use cases for crypto and a bit of an intro for Corbin. So he provides education, research and consultancy services for organisations looking to get involved with the blockchain space and along with empowerment through education and research. One of his core capabilities is product and service ideation with a knowledge on how to create products using Web3 technology. He has provided education and consulting services and to accounting and financial advisory firms across New Zealand. He has presented blockchain content to live audiences at events and has built his own crypto community in Queenstown and has contributed to a number of DAOs in various ways. His mission is to empower users to interact with smart contracts, bringing the current rate of crypto holders interacting with smart contracts from 5 to 50% and believes that in the next 5 to 10 years, every business will have their own crypto and Web3 strategy. So the format for this session, we're going to try and keep it interactive and Corbin is very happy for anyone to chime in at any point in time to ask questions. So please feel free to leave your cameras on if you can. This session will be recorded and then following the session, we'll just ask you to complete a short survey at the end, which we'll use to develop for future Web3 learning series events. So I'll just hand over to you, Corbin, and you can kick off the session. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Okay. Can everyone see that screen there? Yep, all good. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Corbin. As Kelly mentioned, I'm the founder of Interrupt, and I'm here today to talk to you about real-world use cases for crypto. And just a little bit on why I want to talk about real-world use cases for crypto or why I've chosen that topic. Recently, I have seen interactions in the real world, people using cryptocurrency in their day-to-day -day lives. There's a business in Queenstown where I live, which is accepting payments through Bitcoin or the Lightning Network. And I found it really exciting. I was, I was hanging out with a friend who's also a crypto guy. We were just having a coffee and he paid for his coffee and his croissant using his crypto directly from his phone. And I thought that was really exciting. That same day, I walked out onto the street and saw a sticker someone had stuck on a, like, uh, it was like a, a street lamp or something like that for the pest free and Z token, which also got me kind of excited. And previously at an event in Christchurch, a friend of mine who is the founder of Hope Earth, he was based in New Zealand, an American guy. He's now moved to Europe to focus on that project. We raised like 14 grand on a NFT auction, which happened live during the party. And I thought that was really exciting. Like I've spent so much of my time deeply involved in this ecosystem but mostly anonymously online and I'm, I'm starting to see it making its way into the real world which really excites me so that's that's one of the reasons that inspired me to host this learning series on real world use cases for crypto the other sort of thing that i i mean when i say real world use cases for crypto and kelly alluded to this earlier uh, I was listening to the web series, which was done months ago, that the IRD hosted, and they mentioned that only about 5% of Kiwi crypto holders, or at least the ones that are communicating that they're crypto holders to the IRD, interacting with smart contracts, or, or they, the way they said it was interacting with DeFi, but I see that as interacting with smart contracts. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I just think as crypto holders or, or users or would-be users, if we're not interacting with smart contracts, like why, why are we here? I, I understand the, the thought of like hedging our, our investments with alternatives in the crypto space, but really for me, the, the juice of being in this place is interacting with smart contracts. That's where the fun of it is. And so I, I see interacting with smart contracts as real world use for crypto. Uh, and the other thing that I wanna talk about is enterprise use cases for crypto. So I, I believe we're kind of coming to a time or an era where I want to see more adoption, mass adoption. And I think the, the infrastructure is at a point where we are able to create use cases. And I think we're going to see more and more enterprises creating use, use cases. And so I want to 
talk about enterprises that are doing that and maybe empower some enterprises, hopefully in New Zealand, to think about how they might want to approach doing that. But yeah, so in my day to day, I talk about crypto a lot. I'm very passionate about it. And I, and I come across a lot of misunderstandings about what it's actually used for. A lot of people think it's just, you know, this speculative um, internet magic money. As I say, there's actually use cases for this stuff. And that's what I want to talk about. Before I get into it, I, just a disclaimer, I'm not the most technical person. I have a business background uh, and I have, I have published a little bit of code, but that was quite a headache for me. And I sort of had to like self learn through tutorials, which I found on the internet. And I, and I sort of just did it so that I had an idea of what it meant to connect a front end to a back end and, and what the contracts I'm interacting with actually are. But again, yeah, not, not the most technical. I'm, I'm more like a, a power user, I would say. And so if you, if you are super technical and you're listening to me speak, you, you might hear some of the things I say and, and want to go a bit deeper on them or understand it on a much deeper level, which is great. I'm trying to share information to people who, who don't have that technical understanding. So it might come across a little bit low, low brow for you if, if you're really deep in the weeds. I think that positions me well, though, to, to communicate this information. I am more of a real world person, as I say, with a business background, did a bunch of sort of marketing work and, and eventually went into the guiding industry after kind of getting fed up with the corporate world. So spent a lot of time guiding people through situations they were uncomfortable with out in nature, not online. But I think there's those skills will be useful in this space because again it's it's guiding people through uncomfortable situations not necessarily uncomfortable hopefully exciting situations but situations they're not familiar with through the call or the chat i i might use the words cryptocurrency crypto assets blockchain distributed ledger technology or web3 i kind of use these words interchangeably i i don't really like the word cryptocurrency because not really many crypto assets are actually currencies at least not in my perspective and not from the perspective of a, lot, of a lot of regulators. I mean, stable coins might be considered currencies, but, but otherwise I think mostly what we're dealing with are, are assets and new forms of assets. So I try to just use the word crypto. And when I say crypto, I'm kind of alluding to that crypto assets. I think crypto is really exciting. I think it is an evolution in how we as society and as individuals and as organizations able to interact with value. And if we look at the internet and how it has revolutionized various technologies from writing and publication, used to be books, encyclopedias, libraries. Now we have Wikipedia, blogs, websites, universities have their own websites and at the click of a button we have access to all of this information which in the past we had to um, like get a hold of a book or or get a hold of an expert to, to figure out this information. Now we can just communicate seamlessly online. We used to have to write letters to each other. Now we can send emails or send instant messages. And I, my personal belief is that that technology, the internet or interconnected networks hasn't, hasn't quite um, evolved money and trade and transfer in the same way that it has with other technologies. Whilst it's true that you, you can use money over the internet, I don't think we've actually mm -hmm. seen the concept of money be redefined by the internet. And that's what I believe that crypto is. Also, we're at a day and age where we're seeing a rise of global economies. We're all interacting cross-border. We've got the rise of the BRICS nations as an example of, of nations banding together for trade alternatives. And I think this is a prime time for an internet of value to, to, to rise in, in alignment with globalization. On top of that, in recent years, there has been a lot of mistrust in incumbent institutions, including central banks and governments, and that might be due to things like in inflation. I don't really want to talk too much about my personal views on that. I think that's irrelevant. But what I do think is really exciting about cryptocurrency is that we are using like math and code and cryptographic truth to enforce contracts and trade as opposed to relying on the brands of established institutions. And I think we have the opportunity to build the future here and we're kind of on the bleeding edge of history. This is 
I wasn't there for, for other times in economic history, but from my understanding or, or my perspective, this is kind of the most exciting time in economic history. And, and we're at the front edge of that and we have the opportunity to contribute to that. And I think that is incredibly exciting. And where I sort of see the crypto industry and where we're at in terms of its development. So we had the, the Byzantine general's fault, which was solved with the creation of Bitcoin. And with Ethereum and other layer one blockchains, we have the ability to create programmable smart contracts. Uh, following on from that, smart contracts weren't really that useful until we had data able to be plugged into smart contracts. And so with the data availability layer, the complexity of the things that we were able to program has increased. And now I think we are moving into the interoperability layer. So a world where all the blockchains that we are currently using or not using or looking at reading at reading about studying are uh, kind of their own islands and i think we're coming to a place where we're going to connect all of those islands together and we're going to be able to create smart contracts on one chain and utilize aspects of other chains and flow our assets from one blockchain to another and the composability of the interoperable layer i think it's going to unlock a huge amount of use cases in the same way that the data availability layer unlocked a huge amount of use cases back in sort of 2020. And from my understanding, this is kind of like the TCP IP moment that the internet had. So once upon a time, businesses, organizations, governments all had their own intranet, which a lot of them still do, but they were kind of their own islands, like blockchains are their own islands now. And then once we were able to connect all those islands together, that's when the internet really rose to become what it is today. Quick disclaimer, the information provided on this learning series is for informational purposes only. It should not be construed as financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor. I don't have any formal training in financial planning. Any opinions, recommendations expressed on this webinar are solely recommendations. Oh, there are no recommendations, they're solely opinions. I don't claim to know everything. There's, there's way too much to know and investing is an incredibly risky thing to do, especially in crypto assets. And when speaking about crypto to anyone, my first piece of advice is please, please don't invest in crypto assets. And, and then it's up to them if they want to go deeper down the rabbit hole. Yeah, I'm just sharing information in my thoughts here. I'm not trying to encourage anyone to make any moves in the space at this point. Okay, so a little bit about my background and why am I here? Kelly gave a little bit of uh, information about myself and my company and what it is I am looking to do. But prior to starting Interrupt, I studied business marketing in Australia at Newcastle University, then went on to work in a marketing role for a large retailer in Australia. Uh, I was in my early 20s and wanted to do an overseas experience. So I moved to London and landed a job in a management consulting firm there. It was like a medium-sized firm. Um, we were working with some pretty interesting clients, HSBC, Unilever, the Financial Conduct Authority. And I had a great experience there. I learned a lot about the consulting industry, learned about, a lot about the corporate professionalism. Uh, but I felt something was sort of lacking there for me in terms of excitement in my day-to-day -day and actually what I was achieving. And around that time, I met the founders uh, who were from Finland of a startup which was looking to take waste to energy technology, which is quite prolific in Scandinavia, to developing nations. And that really excited me. I, I thought, here's some new technology, something that can be brought into the world. Startup culture was very buzzwordy at the time, so that was exciting to me as well. And I thought we'd be able to solve some, some real problems in the world. So we, yeah, we're looking to take waste energy burners into Indonesia initially. I invested my own money into that and spent about a year in Indonesia trying to you know, gather more funding and deal with creation of a proof of concept over there, which turned out to be incredibly difficult. A lot of regulatory issues. We came up against a lot of corruption, language barriers, all sorts of stuff. There was an earthquake on the island that we were trying to work on eventually got to a point where the money I had and others had invested sort of ran out and we hadn't really 
gotten too much of a footing over there. So I ended up parting ways with that organization. But it was there that I first had my mind turned on to cryptocurrency. So one of the other investors who was there working on the project, who is now a great friend, has been in crypto for a long time. And I, I had an interest in investment. That's obviously why I was investing and in participating in a startup. And he was talking a lot about cryptocurrency. And at the time, I thought crypto was a scam. I was sort of of, of that. I was sort of of the school of thought that you, you put 10% of your income into the S&P 500 or something similar. And that was the best that investment could be. And he was telling me about Bitcoin and Ethereum and, and other projects. And I was, I didn't really understand what he was talking about. That was back in 2017. Mid 2019, he convinced me to finally get some exposure to the industry. So I put a little bit of money into crypto, didn't really think too much about it. That was just like 5% of my investment por portfolio. And I continued investing in ETFs and stocks and what have you. I had moved back to New Zealand at this point, was doing some work with a company in the South Island who produces like facilities for product testing or vehicle product testing. And at that point, I, I kind of, yeah, had decided I, I wanted out of like corporate world, corporate life being incredibly professional just wasn't really that suited to my character. And so I got into the guiding industry at that point and I spent a few years taking people into the mountains, taking kids overseas and teaching them how to travel, had some really great experiences doing that. And again, I think really developed that ability to educate people and guide them through unfamiliar environments. And then COVID hit and guiding was dead overnight. And I was at home and financial markets were obviously going crazy. I spent a lot of my, my lockdown time just studying financial markets, I suppose. I made a call to a family friend in Australia who does some statistics work on the Australian Stock Exchange. He told me, like, this is a great time to be involved with investment. So I just, I just went deep. And, and at the same time, that little bit of crypto that I had exposed myself to in 2019 was acting very differently to the returns I was making on the NZX. And I had a few, a few, what I felt were like user experience issues with traditional investing. So starting with the, like buying stocks on the NZX, uh, I was going through ASB and they made it quite difficult, the KYC process. There was a lot of IPOs happening at the time and I was struggling with the idea that all these like series A and series B funding rounds were taking place. And then I was getting access to stocks at the IPO and they were just, you know, like dumping when they hit the market. And at the same time, I came across uh, another environmental startup in New Zealand, which I thought was really exciting. And that was Geo40. They were trying to extract, or they're still trying to extract lithium from a geothermal vents around Taupo. And I was like, this is great. I want to get involved with this. And I got in touch with their um, chief financial officer and I was like, hey, I want to invest. He sent me a non-disclosure agreement. We went through all the process. And then before I was able to actually transfer them some money, he was like, hey, just want to check that you're an accredited investor. And I was like, no, I'm not an accredited investor. And he was like, oh, well, you can't participate in this. And, and that was kind of like the penny drop moment for me where I was like, in the crypto ecosystem, I can gain access and I can participate at any level that I want with ease without having to go through KYC processes, dealing with like international companies doing so 24 hours a day. And then, and then I'm trying to exist in this other world of investment where uh, there's, I'm just continually facing barriers. And so I decided to just focus all of my attention into crypto. I made my first few swaps on Uniswap back in early 2020. And, and from there, I just, just ran with it essentially spent I've been spending 20 to 30 hours a week researching pretty much ever since. And so I've gone through like quite a process of learning what Bitcoin is, what Ethereum is, what smart contracts are, going through the process of interacting with them online, going through the process of delving through crypto Twitter and trying to figure out the difference between real information and psyops and LARPs. And then 
following organizations, getting involved with DAOs and keeping up to date with the industry has essentially been a full-time job alongside my full-time job, which I'm currently working at now as a contractor um, for a business which operates here in the South Island, looking to create alternatives to housing or, or like the production of housing. So we create straw insulated panels, which is like a newly engineered product in New Zealand. We've worked a lot on the actual engineering facilities of how to create these panels. And they're made from locally sourced ingredients, environmentally friendly ingredients, straw, clay, lime, um, as opposed to the stuff like jib and, and all sorts of other materials which go into our housing in New Zealand, which create pretty poorly insulated houses, as we all know. What we're looking to do is create well insulated, low carbon intensive houses to heat. Um, and so again, working in that kind of like in, environmental area, working on solutions, for a better future. Alongside that, I've just been deep in the crypto ecosystem. And as Kelly mentioned, I've done some work with accounting firms and financial advisors, just helping them with understanding what they're actually dealing with. And yeah, we'll interrupt. What I'm looking to do is create a, I'm looking to provide this knowledge that I've spent all this time researching and developing for myself. I just want to share it. I find myself talking to people everywhere I go about crypto and I see there's a lack of knowledge in the space. And as I said, I think in the next five to 10 years, every business is going to have a crypto or web three strategy. And I think anyone who's interacting with value or creating value in any way is going to want to understand crypto at some point. And so I'm just looking to facilitate that and help, help people and organizations who want to get involved with the space. I really just want to contribute. Crypto Web3 is all about contribution. And I think the best way I can contribute is through education. I might speed up a little bit. I'm just looking at the time. I might, yeah, try and summarize things a little bit more. So just to give some examples of real world integrations that I am seeing so that people are aware that this is, I mean, you guys who are on this call are obviously aware that crypto is a real thing and, and it's, it's coming to fruition, but maybe people in, in retrospect will watch this video who are a bit more skeptical as to whether or not crypto is real. So things that I'm seeing in, in my day, day life and reading about obviously Bitcoin lightning payments um, or Bitcoin payments in general, as I mentioned, my friend bought his croissant with Bitcoin the other day, PayPal launched their own stable coin, you know, PayPal, PayPal being an, a native internet, like money transfer service. I think that's a pretty big deal. There's various card payment options to use your crypto. I, I spend, I have a card, a Wirex card, and I spend my crypto in stores and bought petrol with it, for example. And then recently I saw that Shopify is integrating crypto settlement options, which I think is great. And we've got online merchants taking transactions in, in crypto, which I think is like the, the start of, of the crypto entering sort of the mainstream and it's probably going to do so in a way that's abstracted into the background through our favorite apps like Shopify. A big one that I've been following for a long time is SWIFT, so the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication. I've been working on a proof of concept. SWIFT, by the way, is, is the interbank messaging network. They work with 11,500 institutions. You might have heard about SWIFT earlier in the year where they were talking about banning SWIFT Russia from interacting with the SWIFT network. The, the BRICS nation is also talking about using smart contracts to settle their messaging for their currency. But SWIFT, just a couple of weeks ago at Cybos, which is the SWIFT, I always forget what this stands for, the SWIFT International Banking Operations Seminar announced success of their proof of concept where they have connected private bank chains to public blockchains and they've made transactions between banks and blockchains. And an example of this, which was given was the ANZ Bank, which I think is a great example because it's close to home. Obviously they operate in New Zealand. ANZ's got over a trillion dollars in assets and they were able to take New Zealand dollars from the real world Put that onto their private blockchain as an Australian dollar stablecoin, and then purchase 
from a public blockchain carbon credit known as a reef credit. I, I think they had a hand in creating the reef credit and they were able to transfer that reef credit back to their private blockchain. And uh, I, was, I was talking about this with my partner and she was like, well, that's great. How does it affect me? And why does it, why does it matter for me? And I think in this example, it doesn't really matter to her if her bank is using a blockchain or, or settling her transactions via blockchain. Um, but some information given by ANZ's um, tokenization lead was that for them, when someone gets paid in Australia, 9% of that goes to their superannuation and taxes also need to be deducted from that. And that whole process of money being paid from an employer, 9% being sent to a superannuation fund, and then that superannuation fund crediting the employee's account with whatever investment their superannuation fund has made to, to their sort of name or their, their tax account and pay taxes on that is about a 15 day process. We're doing that through this like messaging system that Swift has created as a proof of concept. It's about, it's about a 10 minute process to settle all that and pay the taxes on it. So, I mean, it, it probably does affect my girlfriend in that she'd be getting 15 days extra interest on her, on her superannuation fund, but it also uh, has great effects for, for the banks who are connecting with these systems. Obviously, it's just a, a vast improvement of the infrastructure which existed prior to blockchains. And I think this is incredibly exciting and it's something I don't hear enough about. I don't know why not everyone in the industry is excited about the fact that the, inter, the global interbank network is running proof of concepts on how to settle their interbank and international transfers on blockchain. This seems like the thing that the industry has been talking about for years is, is happening right in front of us. And it seems to not get a lot of attention, which blows my mind. Uh, the DTCC is part of that same proof of concept. You can see the DTCC will be converting its ISO 20022 corporate action messages to the Swift SR2023 version. And that version has, that version has, that version of Swift's messaging system has, um, implications for settling transactions via blockchain as well. And the DTCC and Euroclear are like, if you're investing in stocks of any kind in the United States, the DTCC is basically the government's like clearing house, settling house for stock transactions. They, they settled over two, well, last year they settled $2.4 quadrillion in value. And Euroclear is also looking at using the same messaging standard. And I also heard that the Swiss stock exchange is using or looking at using the same messaging standard. So essentially like the, the largest like incumbent financial institutions in the world are talking about moving their operations onto blockchain rails. And that's happening now. Something I didn't mention off the side slide was Citibank. Citibank recently announced that they are looking to tokenize or they have tokenized a large amount of their customers' deposits and assets onto a private blockchain, and that is going to be interoperable with other private and public blockchains. And so essentially the world we're, we're coming to, which goes back to that interoperability layer that I was sort of alluding to earlier, I believe, and what I'm hearing from these institutions is that blockchains are led ledgers, as we all know, and I think like every bank is going to have its own ledger or its own blockchain. And those blockchains are going to be interoperable with all other blockchains or majority of other blockchains. Just some um, scary information for us all here. The Bank of International Settlements uh, recently published a paper on their research for um, central bank digital currencies in which of 86 central banks they surveyed, they said 93% of those are at least doing some research onto central bank digital currencies. I'm not going to spend too much time on that one. Um, I don't think we're all going to be using central bank digital currencies or at least not only central, central bank digital currencies, but that's conversation for another. Some brands. So I'm hearing a lot of information regarding brands adopting crypto, like we do every day when we when we log online and, and see what's happening in the ecosystem. One that I think is really exciting is is Nike with their dot swoosh digital collectibles platform. Some a cool innovation that I'm seeing from these guys is like user users have the opportunity to buy an NFT, which they then have a brand item as an NFT, which is great. But they're also allowing their like consumers or their users to contribute to the creation of these NFTs. 
and I think this kind of points to the the future of how organizations or, or what like DAOs and cryptocurrency and, and this world of like collaboration and contribution might lead to is users and buyers and consumers excuse me creating the products that they that they love that they consume contributing to the brands in the same way that we contribute to DAOs consumers are going to be contributing to the brands that they love and they're going to have the opportunity to profit from contributing to the things and creating the things that they love in conjunction with the brands which i think is super exciting the starbucks odyssey is an improvement upon like past loyalty programs are using nfts to give consumers verified um like stamps on their coffee card essentially which then with their nfts they're able to get access to like token gated events and like special discounts and all that sort of stuff and then reddit has has launched avatars using polygon and you can see some some numbers here that i've posted these this was a, a screenshot i took of the data back in august so these numbers are probably a little outdated but they've made about 40 million dollars in sales volume and obviously the owners of those nfts get to profit off of that as well which i think i guess sort of points to a the world today where individuals in this creative economy have their own brands and identities online. And if we're able to create those brands and identities behind NFTs, then the intangible value of our brands can then be on transferred or rented, for example. And, and we see that with all sorts of NFT projects. A uh, few barriers to adoption. I think things that are, that are slowing the rate of adoption down. I've posted a graph here. This is a, cumulative um, Ethereum wallets over the last few years, we can see that this is growing at a rate of about 20%, which is faster than the rate of adoption of the internet and mobile phones. So this industry is coming and it's coming fast. We're just on that sort of early side of um, the adoption curve. And obviously 20% that is gonna get bigger and bigger over, over the coming years like 20% as a portion of a bigger number is going to you know, grow. It's like a compound interest type formula. Custody is difficult. There's lots of options for custody. This is something that I helped um, a financial advisor on. He called me and he was like, hey, crypto is awesome and I'm exposed to it, but I feel weird about just storing it on my phone. And I was like, what do you mean you just... You're, what do you mean you're storing it on your phone like in a hardware wallet but also multi-sigs there's there's options coming for custody and i think we'll have one click logons and we'll also have trusted institutions offering custody and we already have that but we'll see more and more of that and again that'll probably be abstracted away into the back end of your favorite banking app something i really hope people are aware of by now is the difference between self-custody and centralized custodians e.g ftx there's the technical complexity of understanding these systems and interacting with them is still like very difficult, I would say. And it's not something you can, ex I could expect my grandma or even my dad to do. This is something that I want to provide knowledge on. And this is something I want to solve for with Interrupt is organizations or individuals who want to get involved with these systems or need a hand with understanding how to actually do it. That's something I want to be able to help people with. Infamy crypto is obviously um, known as like a scammy industry and to be fair 95 percent at least uh, as an estimation of the industry are scams and figuring out what is and what isn't a scam is often quite difficult a good example of that was ust luna offering a 20 percent return on ust staking i i looked at that and i thought like 20 percent that's amazing like i can i can outperform inflation but i was like but where is this 20 percent coming from and it didn't take long to figure out that they were just printing more UST without any like revenue coming into the protocol to be able to afford to print more UST. So I avoided that one and I'm, I'm glad that I did. But obviously you've got examples like Ethereum where the staking has actual like economic income backing the stake that's being returned to like stakers. Regulatory issues are obviously a, a, a big problem. I'm hoping that we see more and more clarity over that. Well, with that over time, especially in the United States, but regulatory or around the world is kind of a, a gray area and something that's sort of difficult to work with. Hopefully things are starting to lighten up with these ETF applications. Maybe we'll see more clarity around the, the right for institutions to offer crypto, at least in the United States. We've got like the, the MICA guidelines and rules 
that have come out in, in Europe, which have made things a lot more clear. Other countries like the UK are a bit more progressive than the US. I think well, hopefully once the US sort of makes a, a bit of progress there, the whole industry will have an opportunity to benefit from the growth available from that. And then, yeah, tra- traditional finance gatekeeping, I think it's, in, in my experience, again, I was banking with ASB and I was trying to buy crypto off of a centralized exchange. I was trying to on-ramp onto Binance at the time. I use Easy Crypto now, which is much better. Yeah, ASB blocked my, my transactions onto Binance. I had to call them and get them to allow my transactions to go through. And yeah, I, I think a lot of the information, well, this is a personal opinion, might be counterculture but i think most of us involved with crypto are kind of counterculture i think a lot of the like fear and uncertainty and doubt that we see in the mainstream media is probably perpetuated by traditional finance institutions who are probably looking to slow adoption by retail before they are able to gain exposure but again a conversation for another time and that's just my own opinion and speculation i don't have any proof of that Okay, so moving on to the meat of this presentation. Well, this is, I need to move quicker, sorry. So data, I think that data is probably the most interesting concept in crypto, at least to me personally. We talk about data being the, the new oil. I think like cryptocurrencies are the pipelines for that oil. Data being available on blockchains is what allows for us to create more complex smart contracts. So that was in 2020, we saw price feeds coming available on blockchains, which allowed for the creation of um, DeFi, essentially. We weren't able to make swaps until we had decentralized price feed data. A a really cool example of a, a new use case for data being published on chain that I am, am seeing and, and excited by is CPI data. So if you've, you've interacted with or seen Trueflation, you can see that we have um, decentralized CPI data being published on chain immutably. And that quite often contradicts the, the data that the US or the UK government, which is the only places that Trueflation operates at the moment, put out to their people. And it, personally, in, in my day to day life, I see prices at the petrol pump, the grocery store, and my rent up a lot more than 7%, which is a reported inflation rate in New Zealand. So I'd be really interested to see, again, I would be interested to see what what actual rates of inflation in New Zealand are. This is, again, using math and, and verifiable data to provide information as opposed to relying, <clears throat> relying on trusted institutions. So I think... Trueflation is a very cool project. Decentralized price feed, again, allowed for DeFi swaps, derivatives, other forms of markets. All of this stuff is composable. So what if we can start using this inflation data in composable ways? What kind of derivatives can we make off of that? What other data can be published on blockchains? For example, I'm seeing use cases where weather data is being published on blockchains. And we think about contracts and businesses and organizations who interact with value, they need data to be able to create contracts. And so the more data that is published onto blockchains, the more complex and and varied contracts we're going to start seeing. And I think there's a huge opportunity in the market at the moment for people who hold data to publish that onto blockchains. So another cool example of, of data I've seen being shared on a blockchain, which is through a data marketplace. A decentralized data marketplace was a Swiss car manufacturer who had compiled uh, a lot of images of stop signs, road markings, pedestrians, etc. that they were using to train their AI models, which were um, training their self-driving cars. And so they published this, all of these photos, and these training photos onto a data marketplace, and they were able to sell that to their competitors. And I go back to... I used to work for a company which created facilities for car companies to test their products. And we had so many companies coming in and doing the exact same sorts of testing to find the exact same sorts of data, but they were doing it like privately and holding that information to themselves. And if we can add value to data and publish that in a way that we can then trade and create derivatives off of our data, we're creating an an entire new industry And as I said, data is the new oil over the last 10, 20 years. We've been seeing companies like Facebook and Google profiting massively off of our data. And we're coming into an age where we're going to be owning our own data and organizations that have valuable data will be able to publish that data. And it 
end, if you've got data or organizations have data which might be valuable for the creation of, of contracts, we can think about publishing that onto blockchains to create entire new industries of contracts and new, wherever our imagination can take us with the composable nature of writing contracts. I also think a pretty interesting concept is like AI compute. So we look at ChatGPT, the founders of that launched WorldCoin, which is supposedly a proof of humanity uh, project. And I've, we're coming into a world where AI is producing so much content that how do we actually know what is produced by real humans and what is produced by AI? I think it's interesting that WorldCoin has been created by ChatGPT. I think later down the line, we might possibly see a world where content published online, be it by authorities like governments or like your favorite actor or musician or whatever to verify that that content is real and produced by a human as opposed to produced by AI, we could be using um, the likes of private keys with our publications to verify that that was our work. And I've also heard work from Eric Schmidt, who's a former CEO of Google. He now runs Schmidt Ventures. Um, he works with the White House. He's very focused on AI at the moment, talking about using private keys to limit the ability of AI to make great decisions. So as a high example, high level example, the, the nuclear launch codes could be held in a way that a multi-sig of the president and their 15 most trusted people, as well as delegates from the UN all need to sign from their private keys to confirm that we want to launch a, a nuclear missile. Just, just as an example, I hope that never happens, but, but as a way to keep AI from launching the, the nukes, we could be using private keys to do that. So DeFi, I, I imagine we all know a bit about DeFi, so I'll probably brief breeze through this one, but DeFi is really what got me hooked into crypto, as I mentioned. The basics of DeFi are swaps, trading, lending, borrowing. I was really amazed back in 2020 that I was able to lend money or like borrow money from one of these decentralized protocols in a matter of about two minutes. And at the time I was living with a mortgage broker and I told her about that process and she was like totally blown away. She was like, I would have to go through so many interviews with a person, I would have to check all their IDs, I would have to check their bank accounts and their income and all that sort of stuff. Whereas I was able to log on to Aave, deposit some funds, borrow money against it, done. And I think that obviously has use cases around the world for, for various things, including the unbanked people in developing nations who might not have access to these like sort of banks and institutions. And as well, because I just don't really want to go to a, to a bank to borrow money. No offense if there's any bankers listening to the chat. I would prefer to go through DeFi rails. I would prefer to have control over, over my money. I would prefer to be able to see where and how they're utilizing the funds that I'm giving them. So when I lend money to money market fund in DeFi, I can see the interest that they're earning on my money. Whereas if I lend money to the bank, I, I know they're probably earning 20% interest on it and giving me 1% of that, which just, I don't know, a world of verifiable truth, truth I think is very, very appealing to me. A growing trend that I'm seeing is tokenized real world assets. So T-bills, bonds are coming on chain and there's also gold tradable on chain, which is backed by verifiable proof of reserves. Um, and I think we'll see more and more commodities and other forms of derivatives coming on chain. I think eventually we're going to see real estate, car warrants, and we're going to see probably because these are smart contracts, when I go to work and I make a deal with my boss that I'm going to work for this amount of time, for this amount of money, that's probably going to become a smart contract as well. So I, I really think that DeFi is the basis for the evolution of how we interact with value. And that's going to touch uh, probably all forms of value aside from perhaps car boot sales or people like growing veggies in the yard and swapping it with the neighbors for the fruit that they've grown in their yard. BlackRock is obviously looking at launching an ETF along with every other ETF provider in the US. So I think we're seeing more and more institutional demand. Insurance contracts on chain are a really exciting thing. So as I mentioned earlier, where the data being provided on chain allows for insurance contracts to be created for crop farmers. In the West, it's easy to get, well, it's not easy to get, but you can get insurance against your crops. If there is a flood or a drought, you can get a payout against what you would have grown in developing nations, they don't have access to that, but I've seen cases of 
whether data being published on chain verifiably proving that there was in fact a drought in this part of Africa uh, in this season. And so farmers in that country via their mobile phone were able to take out insurance policies against their crops and have that paid out instantly without having to make a claim against their crops or, or to the insurance agency. The, the smart contract just knows that there was a drought in it and it pays out those farmers, which is super exciting. Prediction markets are kind of interesting, kind of fun to play with. But really, I think imagination is the limit when it comes to DeFi because of the composable nature of, of all of these money Legos and smart contracts. We're just going to see more and more complex use cases touching every aspect of what we can imagine in terms of how we interact with value. Okay, I'm going to try and speed up a little more. Um, I think it's pretty easy to see the move toward creator content in recent years. Like we've got all these Instagram and Facebook and TikTok influences. Um, other platforms such as like Twitch where creators can be paid directly by their fans. I think this industry is obviously being or going to be taken over by cryptocurrency or going to evolve into a crypto crypto based industry. Cool examples of this that I have seen recently, Friend Tech, if I'm sure most people have heard about that by now. It's essentially just a token gated chat room, but I think creators are already innovating on how they can provide value in that space. And I think this is just like the first look at an example use case which i think will come to the fore and, and be very exciting in the world where creators can offer their fans their customers their consumers like verifiable say nfts if i was like a, a musician and i had created an nft and i sold it to 500 people as an example and i said those 500 people get to listen to my my new album early or they get to come to a, a special meet and greet with me and, and at the door my security can check their nft and verifiably they have that nft so they're verifiably one of my top 500 fans as an example so they get to come to the, the meet and greet that's just one example i can think of of how the creative economy is going to be revolutionized by cryptocurrency ticketing i think is another really cool space for nfts uh, I have gone to a really cool event the last few years and the way they do their ticketing because it's a small event, only 500 people can attend. They say the first load of tickets are available for people who attended the event last year because they're trying to create this community that, that runs through the event and they sell as many as they can to people who were there last year. And then after that, they open the next round of tickets to people who have ever been to the event ever. And then after that, they open the ticketing to anyone. And I know the person who throws the event and she spends a lot of time going through people's um, applications for tickets and she has to individually approve that like, oh yes, this person was at the event last year and I can see that based on last year's ticket sales data. If you hadn't done that on an NFT and you could write a smart contract that says, if applicant has NFT from last year, allow purchase and that could all be done just automatically through smart contracts which it would be a huge improvement on my friend's life i think she she gets a bit of a kick out of doing it but there's also the, the possibility that holding these these tickets from past events gives us access to again like token gated communities online and allows the the collection of nfts allows for us to sort of create communities around products and ideas and events and, and we see that with you know profile picture projects or like generative art projects the people who hold these nfts are excited and involved with the community and i think this is again like where we're seeing economies go is community-based contribution like micro economies and that is sort of easily done through through token gating on-chain credentials, I think, is a, another really exciting thing. For example, I went to university in Australia. If I'm applying for a job, I have to like find my photocopied version of my transcript from my degree or get in touch with the university and pass that on to the employer. If I had like a, a wallet which held my credentials and I could give that wallet address to a prospective employer, they'd be able to click on my wallet scroll through and see that I got grade X in this class and grade Y in that class, which I think, again, is just an improvement on, on past technologies. Oh, so, something I was going to add um, probably fits under creator content and NFTs is intellectual property. 
So as, as we're publishing things on chain, we have like verifiability that we were the ones that published it. And this was the date and time that we published it. And we can verify that on chain. And I think intellectual property is gonna, gonna benefit largely from, from this innovation. Environmental initiatives. So there's a few ways in which cryptocurrency is being used to create environmental initiatives. A, a friend of mine is creating a, a carbon accountancy project. You've got ClimateDAO, obviously. My friend's one is Hope Earth. Leanne, who was on here recently with Trade Cool Labs. And again, talking about ANZ's um, proof of concept where they, they bought the carbon credit on a public blockchain and transferred it to a private blockchain. I, I, I see this as a, a pretty great use, use case for cryptocurrency. Apparently, the, I've never had to buy carbon credits before, but apparently it's a very old and clunky and um, sort of form of trade where bankers are literally calling people over the phone and saying, I want to buy some carbon credits. If we can fractionalize carbon credits, put them on chain, that makes their trade a lot easier and perhaps incentivizes a greener future in, in the way we interact. And in finance or in, in any other form of like value exchange. I'm not, I'm not like a, a energy or a power guy, so I might butcher some of this, but I, I understand that Bitcoin mining can be used for grid stabilization or buyer of, of last, buyer of last resort. I heard a case recently of a wind farm in the U S that was just turning the wind farm off. Even if there was wind, which was able to produce power and it was doing so in a green way when there was no demand for it on the grid, but they put a Bitcoin miner at the base of the power of the wind generation farm so that while the grid was maxed out with energy from other sources and there was no one to buy their power, they were able to mine Bitcoin and continue to earn an income off of, off of the energy, which was in a green way being generated at that site. Same thing can be done with hydro. And I'm seeing some really cool, a really cool project, which is verifying where um, power is being generated from. So for example, if I'm going to charge my electric car, but I don't want to do that in hours where coal is being used to create power for the grid because there's high demand on the grid at the time, I can use a, a blockchain network to look at where power is being sent onto the grid from and, and verify that oh, and during these times the demand is low, I'm able to purchase green energy. And I would love to see a world where we have like smart meterage in the house where I might want to like run my dryer, but again, it's high demand on power and I don't want to burn coal to run my dryer. And I can set my meter to say, oh, once, once the grid is being fed by green energy, turn the dryer on as, as an example. So governance, hopefully we all are a little bit aware of how crypto is working to try and improve governance. Uh, I don't think we're quite there yet, but in various ways, we might not be quite there yet, but at least these are experiments in new ways of how we can govern things. So decentralized autonomous organizations, as I'm sure you all know, are a very cool innovation in the way that we can collaborate and contribute on projects. Some cool examples of DAOs, I think, are Lynx DAO, which they like sold, I believe they sold NFTs. I haven't actually followed it that closely, but there was some form of token gating to get into the Lynx DAO. And they used the, the funds generated from that to purchase a golf course. And then they're now hosting like private events for their DAO community at their golf course. Another example is Cabin DAO. They did a similar concept with buying some land and they, they built a relatively sustainable commune commune i guess on this land and then people who were holders of however they've decided to, to token gate whether that's with a token or with an nft which are essentially the same thing um people are able to go and live there and work and contribute uh and and the funds that are being generated through that community are used to pay for community goods such as power and gas and food and that sort of thing um voting is still a gray area with crypto I think we're trying to improve voting, but there's obviously a lot of civil attacking going on in, in DAOs and voting on various things in crypto. But I, I at least see that this is, again, like trying to make innovations in the way that we can, we can vote on things. And governance, oh, DAOs and various forms of governance, again, innovations or experimentations in community management token gated communities, as I spoke into a little bit earlier, I think are very cool examples of use cases which are immediate within 
sort of the space um, and, and maybe the technology, if we can solve for decentralized identification, one day can mean that, well, the election's on at the moment and I'm going to vote for whoever I'm going to vote for. And at the end of the day, I have to trust that those votes were counted correctly by humans. Well, maybe one day I can just rely on, on cryptographic truth or, or like math to enforce the fact that I voted for who I voted for. But again, I think that's a long way off, but not something that's impossible. So this is kind of my last slide is just how can we facilitate adoption? So as individuals, brands and organizations, what can we be doing to build toward a future where we're all empowered by blockchain? And so my stance on this is that I think the people who are interested in crypto are going to get into crypto on their own accord. And probably a lot of those people are already there or at least have already dabbled. And so I think if we want to see mass adoption and we want to see the world empowered by this as organizations, we need to be building incentives for people to use, to use crypto. So if I'm a brand or I'm a creator or I'm like some sort of other institution, if I can be creating products which improve the lives or, or give some novel improvement or excitement to my consumers, that is going to onboard people. That's, I, yeah, I think we're at a point where all the people who want an alternative to fiat currency or all the people who want to invest in alternative assets are probably here. This is where I see brands like Nike giving their consumers the opportunity to create their own brand items or brands like Starbucks doing their loyalty programs via NFTs or like friend tech giving people the ability to connect with in a token gated way their their favorite influences or like another example i heard was the kings of leon released an album which was an nft and individuals who bought that nft would get lifetime tickets to their concerts i think we're at a place where we we have enough of the architecture ready to build out user products and that's i think is what's going to onboard the next billion people and that's what i want to kind of work on i guess yeah and that is kind of um my spiel thank you thank you for listening nice thanks corbin you're a wealth of um, knowledge and there doesn't seem to be any shortage of use cases. Actually, it would be great to get some of the links of the projects you are referring to. So we oh, can, totally, yeah. Um, I actually have a, a slide with the links on it, which I can share somewhere. Yeah, great. I'll, I'll post them into the community after this. But yeah, does anyone have any questions for Corbin or any other interesting use case? Thanks, Corbin. How are you going? <laughs> uh, yeah, good, thanks. How are you? <laughs> Great. Yeah. Good to uh, hear from someone that I have not met before. Do you work with, uh, you know, Rob Clarkson down there in Queenstown? Uh, I have had some interactions with Rob. Yeah. Okay. He wasn't the person you were referring to before because he's doing like Bitcoin meetups down there. Is that right? No. Yeah. So he, he does Bitcoin meetups. I do kind of crypto general meetups, but he came okay. along to one of my meetups and we hosted it at a venue where his lightning payment infrastructure is being adopted. And it was another friend of mine who paid for some stuff using oh, okay. Rob's network. Yeah. Good to, good to know. And if I end up in Queenstown one day, I'll look you up. Cool. I'll let Nathan ask his question. Yeah, thanks so much for your time. A, a great presentation. I, I've been sort of ranting in the the chat. I hope it's yeah. useful. Yeah, I'm. You know, I, I was in New York for 15 years, and, and now I'm in, in New Zealand. And what what's your general thought on the New Zealand regulatory environment, considering Dasset's recent news and like kind of given the uh, Cryptopia um, history as well. Yeah, I did actually write something about regulation in New Zealand, but yeah, again, it's a gray area. I watched a, a good learning series, which was posted by or posted in this knowledge hub 
it was one of the first ones I think that was done, which was regulation in New Zealand. And obviously it's, it's difficult. You don't want to just open the doors to anyone and everyone because you're probably going to open the doors for a lot of scammers and a lot of like rug pulls and, and anything else that people can get away with. But at the same time, I don't think you want to like kneecap innovation. I mean, it really, it really is a tough one. I mean, I would, I would hope that the way this, I mean, partially don't hope, but I would hope that the way that this technology is built is in such a way that anyone who's interacting with these systems has probably had to go through a KYC process somewhere. If you're onboarding funds onto easy crypto or Binance or whatever, someone has, has your information. And if, and if you're a scammer and you're using tornado cash to wash your funds, then that's being watched as well. I don't really, I don't really have the answer. I, I don't think it's a great idea to, yeah, just let, oh, I don't know. Like I've, I, I want to see innovation. I want to see people try things. I want to see people build things. At the same time, I don't want to see people losing money. I don't want to see people getting scammed. I think this is at its current state, really a, a matter of like, there are incredible risks with interacting with these systems. And I mean, something like Gasset or FTX maybe would have been a little harder to to see or predict. Personally, I didn't have any funds on either of those exchanges just because I, in my research and, and learning about getting involved with these blockchains, the systems or, or what have you, had it kind of like put in my head that you shouldn't, you shouldn't trust a centralized authority. That's kind of why we're using cryptocurrency. We should self-custody our own assets. And, and for that reason, I wasn't exposed to any of these centralized exchange collapses, but I feel very sorry for anyone who was. Um, and I don't necessarily think it was their own fault. I, yeah, I mean, at, at this point, I think it's a matter of only, only play with funds that people are willing to lose. It's almost a little bit like gambling. Like it's not, but it, you know, you get, if you would ever go to a casino or even invest in stocks, like you would be willing to lose that money, I would hope. And, and I think if we can educate people not to be exposed to centralized organizations such as FTX or Dasset, hopefully that will inhibit more people losing money in that way. And maybe it will take like trusted institutions, which are, are backed by insurances such as banks to be able to fill that, that role of centralized custodians. I, I'm, I really don't have the solution for that. Yeah, it's a Andy Higgs here. It's a really important issue. Something that really worries worries me deeply. Yeah. We we knew both uh, companies really well. I mean, the Cryptopia situation was incompetence. They they put all the keys on a Excel spreadsheet, and it was an inside job and hacked. The Dasset appears to be criminal and insufficient oversight in the CEO by by the board but you know that's you know let, let's see what what happens there but the the, the regulatory situation in New Zealand is actually pr pretty good i mean obviously you need enforcement and that's where where the regulators are going but but our current laws are, are pretty good i just put something in the chat the the chat which was yeah, the recommend recommendations to the crypto Select committee inquiry from Jeremy Muir and, and Alex. And I, the only final point I'd just make what, what, uh, got, is this is a really serious barrier to adoption here in New Zealand. And what I'd like to see is a, is a really good custody solution. I've talked to Easy Crypto, to Janine about it, and their view is... This is why self-custody is the only option because you can't trust humans. But, you know, I'd like to see a really trusted institution step mm -hmm. into that gap because the the wealth managers, the asset managers in this country, the funds managers won't touch crypto. And they're all potential custodians. You know, a lot of our, you know, we rely on uh, global players to, to, to protect us, but, but it'd be great to have a really good local custody solution, which wasn't self-custody. So that's probably the opportunity for, for people here. Yeah, we use, we use BitGo to custody and they're, they're US based and they're, they're insured up to, I think, 250, 250 million. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, it, just speaking from my personal experience, like, coming coming here it's such a shame that the two main centralized exchanges 
are just completely full of holes. Oh, no, it's embarrassing. And it's put the industry back probably three to five years here. It's really, really a real shame. And, you know, we tried tried to help, but it's sometimes it's hard because it's individuals, right? And New Zealand's too small and you've got, you know, as I said, incompetence and other other issues with people who really shouldn't shouldn't have ever been in that position. So that was probably the issue, but you know, the, the law will will play out on them, really. Yeah. I mean, so for, for what it's worth, like if people are looking to custody, there are great custodians in the US and in Europe. Yeah, there's not the, the point is there's the great solutions in the US, right? We we rely on them too, but the, yeah, it'd be great to have one here. That was my point. Oh yeah, of course. I mean, if you could if you could have a local, <laughs> I mean, you know, it should integrate with zero, which is another big New Zealand accounting software, you know. Yeah, and when, the biggest issue is that you, when you talk to like the you know the financial high street here in Auckland, without naming names, they're all like, you know, we don't need crypto. We're very focused on New Zealand and Australian investments. You know, it's a bit of a closed shop, and it's a real barrier to growing the economy that they don't embrace these things because of you know the cultural thing, and they blame the law that the law is not clear enough and they're not allowed to touch crypto. But the issue is actually custody. And we've got these two terrible examples here that are really holding the country back in a big way. But yeah, I think it's fixable, but yeah, it's, <laughs> it is a shame what's happened. Are, are there, what are the lobbying groups like here locally? Oh, uh, well, we, I mean, the, the industry here is really small. I'm, I'm at Futureverse and we're, we're kind of yeah, like- I know, I know Brian there. He, he's been yeah. super- yeah, well, Brian. Yeah, br yeah, br Brian is is the best. Jer the best Minters work work. We're one of the better law firms in town. Jeremy Muir is pretty good, and we are. Pre everyone knows everyone. Everyone's pre pretty organised in terms of trying to lobby that select com committee inquiry. Was was good. It was a good process, and but it's you, you can't you can't be everywhere, right? And when you get a couple of high profile collapses like we have with cryptopia and that said it's it's not 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 great for the yeah and it's hard working in crypto here because everyone is you're tainted by those those case studies <laughs> just quickly thoughts on what you guys have just said is like one that's a huge opportunity possibly i mean maybe the not too caught up on the regulatory red tape maybe it's not possible to create a, a great custody solution at this point but i have wondered what a like great custody solution would look like in terms of storing private keys or having having various it's ways actually of not storing. a technical issue. It's not a technical issue. It's a it's an institution and organizational issue. And it yeah. can't be solved yeah. by government. Yeah. Well it's gotta be solved looking by at, the, um, the people that do it now, which yeah. are, well, are the kind of you know the legacy or institutions. Are, are there are there other digital asset trust companies here locally? Uh, there's a couple of small ones, but they haven't got any traction and they're not credible. So that's the issue. When we you think about the top end of town to get, in, get involved, really. New Zealand's banking landscape is largely Australian bank subsidiaries, right? And yeah. it's, it seems to me like Australian banks, ANZ, Commonwealth and Westpac, I think Westpac recently stopped their crypto custody and, but the Australian banks are moving forward with custody solutions. Oh yeah, take a look. Uh, yeah, ANZ did uh, mm -hmm. a, a big one with um, Chainlink. I'll post the link here. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good example. No, Corbin, I was actually more referring to, you know, entities like Perpetual Guardian, you know, Guardian Trust, which is a supervisor, or you know, to speak, call them out, Jardins, Craig's, <laughs> Foresight Bar. But they're just yeah. not ready to embrace it, you know, because they provide custodial services for, you know, investors and uh, fund uh, managers who don't have the required accreditation. So, yeah. you know, they're, they're the ones that need to do it because they're doing it now. They know how to do it. They're experts in it. Our banks are really just, you know, subsidiaries of the Australians, as you, as you point out. And Kiwi Bank's not really equipped to take these kind of risks. So mm -hmm. it's really more about the investment banks. Cool. Okay. Do do the investment banks even have a mandate to to they don't have a mandate because they're they not even allowed to own crypto. Their wife, you know, their their husbands or their wives aren't even allowed to own crypto. That 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 it's a real no no because they they really if you look at the way they launch a you know list companies here, it's it's a closed shop. You know, the it's an inside job, and you see that that's why the NZX is so screwed. You know, and 
that they need to open their eyes. But yeah, I mean, we're working on it. A lot of my my friends are in these companies, but it's it's hard, and you know, it's it's hard to make headway when we've got such spectacular failures here, like Cryptopia and and Dasset, because it's easy for them to shoot you down. You know. Yeah. Awesome. Were there any other questions for Corbin before we head off? That was great, Corbin. Thank you so much for your time. Really good. Awesome. We'll wrap it up there then. Yeah. Thanks everyone for attending. Thank you so much, Corbin. That was an awesome presentation. And yeah, we'll see you at the next one. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Callahan, thank you for creating this space for us to be able to do this work. Yeah. Amazing. Glad you're enjoying it. Thank yeah. you. Awesome. Thanks, Karen. everyone. Cheers. Thank you.